two o'clock. Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar on FAIR SSH data citation. My name is Dan Bruder, and I'll give you a short introduction on the SHOCK project that's uh, organizing this webinar. And I'll function also as a moderator for the discussion that will take place. But first, some housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded, and if you object to that, please keep your camera and microphone off. The slides are available through a link in the chat. If you have questions, preferably write them in the chat box or ask them do it during the um, question and answer slots. Okay. The speakers of today are Nicolas Larousse from Humanum CNRS, just as Edward G. Cray, and Cesare Concordia, who is from ISTE CNR. Now something about the SHOCK project. Um, SHOCK stands for Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud. It's one of the five so-called thematic cluster projects that represent the research communities in the building of EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. It's a 14 months project and will finish next year, April. We have many partners, but that's fine since the SSH is a complex landscape and needs such a large variety of representing organizations. Our objectives are to represent the SSH in the EOSC process, building our own SSH part of EOSC, promoting and applying open science and fair principles, fostering further integration of existing and new SSH infrastructures, and establishing a governance model for the future SSH collaboration in EOSC. Just to say a little bit more about the shop partner organizations, the key partners and initiators of the project are the European Research Infrastructure Organizations, so SESTA for the Social Sciences, Clarin for the Language Resources and Technology, and DARIA for the Broad Humanities. There are two smaller organizations of social sciences, um, ESS and SHARE, and there is also the Network for Cultural Heritage. Just to show you some of the examples and topics that uh, we have been working on in SHOCK. So um, some of these topics are of interest to multiple infrastructures, while others are more of interest to single infrastructures. So for instance, the use of language technology for the social sciences, machine translation for the translation of services, evidently of interest to both Clarin and the social sciences, just as for instance is building the SSH open marketplace for discovery of SSH services and data by researchers, while something as remote access to sensitive data is mainly of interest for the social sciences. What we are doing here uh, in this webinar is uh, focusing on um, data citation, which is of interest to all. And then, of course, there is the providing of training and training materials, whereof you uh, are profiting of evidently today. Some shock offerings that are ready to test. Uh, there is a link here to the beta edition of the SSH Open Marketplace and the link to the um, training material discovery toolkit. And let me close then with uh, announcing also two future training events. There will be a shock workshop on copyright issues and the secondary in the secondary data use. And the other one is on data management planning and overcoming the challenges in social sciences data sharing. And with that, I'd like to give the floor to the first presenter, Nicolas. Thank you, Dan. 
So I'm Nicolas Larousse, I'm uh, from uh, Humanum, CNRS in France, and I'm going to introduce uh, what, we, what we have done so far in uh, the CHOC project about data citation. And first of all, of course, some um, just to remind what it is important to have data citation in SSH, uh, some uh, different, different reasons are uh, different good reasons to cite your data in SSH. Uh, of course, uh, transparency of the research process and reprodu reproducibility. Sorry, it's difficult to say in English for me. And uh, so, give credit also to the creator and the founder of the data. This is something which is getting more more, more important right now uh, because founders are now. Uh, they, they ask they ask for the, the data management plan, but they also ask to be recognized as a founder for data. Before and in uh, SSH, data was not that important, but it's getting more and more important. Of course, uh, when you want to reuse data, you, not, you need to have a confidence in the data and to understand how the data was created and what was the context of uh, their production. And uh, one side effect is to give visibility to your research and to the research of uh, other people in SSH. And, and Ed will, will put uh, a focus on the usefulness of infrastructure to, to be able to cite data. And of course, the last thing is to try to reuse data for different research purposes. And uh, this is the case uh, in SSH. It's not really the case, for instance, in astronomy of this kind of... Uh, uh, art science, may I say, but in SSH, sometimes you use the same data to, uh, for instance, for different disciplines. And uh, so it's useful to have a link and a good data citation available to be able to retrieve uh, this kind of data. Of course, data citation in SSH, it's, uh, you, you can take that out, out of the landscape of uh, SSH right now, which is evolving quite rapidly because you have uh, a strong development of the link between data and publications. That means that uh, when you have data, you, can, you may have some publication associated to, the, to this data set, for instance. And of course, in the publication, you have a citation to the data and uh, it makes a sort of graph of uh, people, data, uh, publication and projects, which is really important and something relatively new in SSH is the uh, apparition of <coughs> what we call data papers. And uh, that means that uh, we are going to describe data set and to, uh, to provide visibility also to data set and to provide more information about data set, which led, which led to uh, data journals uh, where data sets and uh, data will be peer-reviewed by people. This is not really, really uh, strongly developed right now in uh, SSH, but this is something which is evolving in so rapidly. What is the current situation in SSH? Uh, you have very, very diverse and, uh, uh, practices about data citation. You know, it's, uh, there's not a very common approach uh, to data citation. The reason why it's, this situation exists, uh, in my opinion, is because you have a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different goals in SSH. So there, are not, there was not a very real standard in SSH about, uh, about citation of data. And also because, uh, I say, let me say five years ago, it was very difficult. It was not very useful to cite data. Data was a side product, and uh, the main product was the publication. But again, it's evolving rapidly right now, and uh, data seems to be more and more important now. Uh, we may say that in social science, uh, th there was a, a long tradition of uh, citation, so it's more developed, and there are more standards there. You have a lot of requirements. It's not uh, it's not uh, that uh, nothing exists. You have a requirement from different projects, for instance, for a precedent uh, cluster project in SSH, which name was Dasish. Uh, 
You have recommendation from RDA, of course, from CESDA, from SHARE, from W3C. And, uh, but there are no real uh, common uh, approach of uh, data citation and common practice in SSH. What have we done? Uh, so you can see uh, some practical examples of uh, a citation in uh, two different formats. And you can see that it can be very structured, like uh, the second one, or it can be a simple string, which is not easy to uh, process. So what we wanted to do in uh, the short project, there, there was different goals, but uh, the first goal was to uh, make this data citation actionable. And we, our approach was a sort of a, so, sort of journey. Uh, we like this metaphor because you know uh, we we jump into data citation and then we discover that uh, it was very uh, it was not that we were thinking at the beginning of the project. So we reshaped a little bit the task and uh, what we have done so far is to the first the first step was to do an inventory of practices and uh, so we discover as I said just before that it was very, very uh, diverse and we need to have a, a sort of a common approach. So we built some recommendation uh, for citation and um, Ed is going to speak about, uh, to, to, to speak more in detail about uh, this uh, recommendation, but we tried to do something very specifically adapted uh, for uh, SSH. And at the end, based on this uh, recommendation, we tried to have some criteria to evaluate some repositories. And again, Ed is going to show you all the results. And in parallel, we developed uh, what we call a fair data citation prototype. And uh, the idea was to, uh, to gather information from different sources to have a good set of information from, uh, to, to build a good citation. And Cesare will explain uh, all about the data citation prototype. So I give the floor to Ed, and uh, we, we come back at the conclusion. All right. Thank you so much, Nicola, for this very good introduction uh, and sort of segue into what I'll be speaking about today. Um, so, you know, when, when we talk about recommendations, I think it's interesting for, for me to, to reflect and think of us as scholars. Citation is one of the fundamental things that we do. I remember when I taught uh, university courses in the United States, the first class I had was talking about the importance of citing your sources. This is something that we hammer over and over and over again. And I, I think it's interesting because we're moving into this new digital age where we have new ways of doing things and the importance of metadata and, and handling data correctly becomes more and more important. Do we really think take a step back and think about, okay, it, you know, several years ago when we were starting out, it maybe was okay to just put a simple string that, you know, sort of goes author, publication, you know, whether it's in Chicago style or APA or MLA. And, and now we need to think about having things be actionable. Um, so sort of to, to come into this new, brave new world that we're facing, we came up with this set of recommendations. Now, these were based on the Force 11 eight data citation principles. Um, so if, if you were to go to that link, you would sort of find the, the general Force 11 principles. And we decided to adapt these based on the needs in the social science and humanities. Once we did this, we further developed this thanks to a peer review process that we went through, as well as a roundtable of experts that we held in May. Um, so we were, were pretty you know, happy that the fact that you know, we came into this, as, as Nicola said, in a situation where there are many different communities of practice. And we made sure that we got the different you know, representatives of these community of practice together to try and think about how can we best make sure that this is broadly applicable to the social science and humanities, which is a very diverse and, 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 and different field. Um, so in general, the way these are set up is following the, the Force 11 principles, we, we sort of identify this societal or technical challenge. Um, so we sort of explain like what, what's going on here. Um, so in, in, in the case of what I put on this screen, we talk about persistence. You know, research data, it should be persistent. It should still be available. Um, it should be available after the life of the project. 
And this is, you know, a really big issue that I think you've all encountered now that a lot of research financing happens based on projects. You have to make sure that the, the money that's invested in it's making these products, that it's the data is still available after. Um, for a long time, this wasn't considered the most crucial thing to do. And, and we're moving towards this, fortunately. So then after we sort of identify this challenge, we talk about the recommendation we have. And this can be a series of recommendations or, or one or two. In this case, it's a series. So it's the importance of, of creating and maintaining sustainable infrastructures for the social science and humanities in order to achieve persistence. Um, it's, it's about the importance of infrastructures to make sure that they will be there longer and longer after the end of the project, after the, the researcher themselves moves on to another project. Um, to, to make these infrastructures that will make sure it's there. We encourage people to use trusted data repositories with that have a very, and by trust, we sort of mean this idea, there's a clear roadmap and really good practices that comply with the standards. And of course, we'll get more into what makes a, a good data repository further on in my presentation. We also have to think about training researchers to build a DMP, a data management plan, at the very beginning of the project. Um, and this, doing this with the support of data stewards and the other experts that really know the, the sort of ins and outs of how to manage your research data. Um, as well, we, we acknowledge you have to support researchers in the execution of their, their data management strategy. Uh, researchers should not be left sort of floating in the wind all on their own. They, they have to have help and, and accompaniment in this process. Um, and then finally, you know, really important thing is, is research data that, that, that's citable. Th that's really the only thing that gets preserved. Um, when, when we think about further on into the future, you can have this data that's available in you know, some Google Drive folder or a GitHub repository somewhere. But if people don't know how to get to it, it, it may as well not exist. So once we go through, we, we've established the challenge, we've established the recommendation. And the next thing we have to do is talk about the expected outcomes. So if you follow these recommendations, what do you expect to get out of it? How is this going to move our field forward? Um, so in general, by by taking into account these recommendations you will enhance discoverability, identification of research, accreditation, because let's be real, the reason that we go through the process of citation is as much to give credit to the people who did the work as it is to, to show where we got our, our research data, and as well as is contributing to the potential reuse, which I think is one of the, the biggest things that we're, we're dealing with um, as we turn into this new digital age. And as well, uh, the outcome that we hope is improving the preservation of research data to help justify and offset the cost of producing it. Because let's be honest, it takes an awful lot of money and an awful lot of public finances go into creating research data. And once this data is created, it should be available for other researchers to use and should just be viewed as the personal property of whatever researcher or lab produced them. So this is just one of the standards of persistence. This is just one of the societal and technical challenges that we wrote about. And there are many more in the documents that I believe, in, and thank you, Athena, for linking to them in the chat. Um, so I invite you to go check them out. But then there's this question, and you may be asking yourself, so who are these recommendations for? Well, I mean, they're, they're really for all stakeholders in the data citation universe of social science and humanities. So this can be a researcher. This can be a research engineer. Uh, this can be a funder. This can be a research infrastructure, a data steward, someone that runs a data repository. The idea is that to bring all the stakeholders together, and, and to sort of lay out for them what needs to happen. And from there, then you discover what sorts of uh, responsibilities have to be done. You can understand sort of the ecosystem as its whole. And that way you're not just in, sort of in your own way, but you understand the entire research data management process and especially how it relates to data citation. So again, I really encourage you to check them out yourself. Um, we, we believe in these recommendations um, and, and we're excited to be able to share with them today. But of course, it's it's nice to have recommendations, but okay, so let's do something with them. And what we decided to do was, was now that we had these data citation recommendations to really go through and select the most pertinent criteria for data repositories and then evaluate them and sort of see where we are as a field and to see what best practices are being followed and, and which ones we need to improve upon. So in this process, we looked at 85 repositories from a very diverse SSH landscape. These repositories were affiliated with SESTA, with Clarin, with Daria and, and other environments. Um, these were identified in the shock project by colleagues in, in task eight. Um, so we really thank them for their help in the identification. So after we had this sort of base that we looked at, we decided, okay, how do we adapt these recommendations? How do we change them? So the sort of four main criteria that we viewed as the most key um, towards having a, a really robust sort of the, the yeah, the, the most robust requirements, but also the ones that were sort of the, the fundamental um, preconditions were the presence of a persistent identifier, a PID. 
and what type of PID it was. It was interesting to us to know whether this would be a DUI, whether this would be a handle, a URN, or whether it would be some sort of homebrew um, permalink. Um, also very important was the presence of a landing page. When we think about a landing page, that is the page when you connect to a data set. It's, it's sort of, if you go to these Zenodo links that are being shared, that's a landing page. It's something that is readable by the human that explains where things are. It's not just directly giving you the data itself, but sort of gives you the metadata and puts it into context um, itself. But important in this landing page is also having structured metadata encoded into the web page because it's very nice to have the, the human, the researcher, being able to read this. But it's even more better and even more powerful if you can have the machine and have the machine be able to, to have this. We call this machine actionability. So it's really important, especially as we'll see when my colleague uh, Cesare comes to speak afterwards about the importance of having these data in there. And sort of the, the fourth and, and final you know, main criteria is, is the presence of a site as. Um, you know, does your landing page tell you, this is how I want you to cite the data? And also, what, what does it look like? Does this look like a string or does this look like something where you can download a bib text file? Is this a, an input where you can select from all the different citation styles you could want? Um, there was diversity there. and We'll get into the results quite soon. And then aside from these main criteria, uh, we also had three other criteria we were interested in checking into seeing sort of developing a really healthy and robust citation environment. Um, so that was the use of standardized vocabularies, such as ORC ID. So when, when you're saying that such and such person is responsible, are you putting their ORC ID in so you can discover this researcher and see their other research outputs? As well as the use of versioning. Um, oftentimes, data sets, they, they get new versions. Things change. You either have to update errors or you have to add in new years or, or new different data sets into it. Um, versioning is really important. And it's really important when we're making an analysis based on a data set to know what version we're talking about and what version we're using. Um, so that the presence to account for this is something we saw as important. And then finally, the presence of links to related publications. Um, we thought this was also very important to see the way that, you know, if you're going to create a, a data set, we should also let people know what research outcomes have come out of it. So again, those were the, the seven criteria we looked at, the four main criteria, and, and then the, the three ancillary criteria. Um, so in general, um, what we did is, is once we analyzed this, we, we produced a deliverable um, that, that was published just earlier this, um, we, we worked on it over the summer, was published this fall. And I sort of invite you to go check it out. Um, this is something that the Task 3.4 team put a lot of work into. But you know, since you're here today, I'll give you sort of the, the Cliff Notes version, especially as it relates to data repositories. Of the four main criteria, you can see that just under 30% had all of the, the four main criteria. But when we think about it, having at least three, you know, you're only missing one of the four. Then you get to the point where it becomes more interesting. We have around 60%. And then once you just sort of reduce down to two, um, so under two can, can either be one or zero, of course, we see that really when, when you're having at least some of these things, we're, we're seeing that it's 90% of the data repositories adhere to at least two of these four main criteria, which is good news. Um, and then looking at the number of total criteria, so this is adding in the, those three other ancillary ones that we spoke about, only one of the repositories actually had all of the, all of the seven. Um, but you can sort of see that in general, having at least three, that represents well over half. Um, so we're quite happy with, uh, I mean, it's encouraging results, but still more work to do. So as I said, it, it, there's still a lot more work to do. 87% of repositories had some form of persistent identifier associated with the data. This was really interesting and really key for us to make sure that we know if we're citing data and we're giving a link, that that link's still going to be there. And again, this could be of multiple different forms, DOI, handle, URN, et cetera. Um, the site has functionality. It's present in just under half of repositories, which is good. It's a very good start. We'd like to see it, you know, 100%. But it's also varying quality. I mean, giving a string, just saying cite this as, you know, name of the author, then name of the data set, where it was from, and, and then giving a permalink, uh, that's not quite as interesting in a machine actionability sense as it is to have something that is, you know, firmly encoded, something that gives you the opportunity to change and gives you a, even as far as having like an entirely downloadable bib text file. Um, so you can sort of see there's a real diversity in what cite as um, can be taken as. And if landing pages, I believe it was over 95% had landing pages, um, we need to be better about having more structured information in these landing pages. Um, and, and I'll discuss that in, in the next slide. 
And then finally, versioning. It only accounted for 23% of repositories, uh, which I think uh, need, needs we should imp work on improving this as a field, um, as well as links to related publications in only 20%. So it's it's these are the beginnings. You know, we're in the we're the dawn of a new age, and and I think you know one of the general sentiments that I had coming out of this is newer repositories tended to do a better, more complete job than older repositories. So I think that we're working and developing towards a, a more adaptable environment. Um, so here are just the, some slides really briefly. I'm not going to dwell on them, um, but they're in the slides that have been shared with you if you would like to have access to the, the information itself. Um, same here with the secondary criteria. Again, I, I sort of gave you the, the Cliff Notes version, and I invite you to look into further details with these either in the slides or in the deliverable that has been linked. But I, I sort of want to end here with the discussion on these landing pages, because these are really the keys um, to machine actionability. So we sort of said, if nearly all, we're, we're looking here, it's it's only 2.4% did not have a landing page. That's, that's two repositories didn't have one of the 85 we looked at. Um, so if nearly all of the surveyed repositories have a landing page, only 45% have structured metadata on those landing pages. Um, so you can see on the on the graph on the right, um, you can see that 55% don't have any structured metadata in the pages, which drastically limits and, and, and sort of breaks the ability to have machine actionability and to have sort of automatic requests. And this is something that, that Chaser will speak about very soon. Um, but when you see the, the presence of embedded structured metadata, um, the, the methodology we used when we looked at this was we took the most present um, so it, it often happened even that you would have uh, structured metadata in terms of uh, Dublin Core, the DC terms, and you'd also have some open graph as well. Um, but we decided to select the one that was the most prevalent um, and, and put that down. So you shouldn't take this to mean that there, there's not mixing going on. Um, but you sort of see that it's it's we're getting there. We're a little under half. Um, but this is something that's really important because by making things machine actionable, you can do automatic requests. You can handle more with APIs. And you can build a really more robust, robust citation environment. Um, so sort of the, the takeaway is how can you use these results, what we talked about here today, in practice to build good citations? You know, before the project, we recommend that you read the recommendations for fair data citation in the SSH and develop your data management plan accordingly. DMPs are something that more and more, I, I know at least here in France, they're required for national honor uh, um, plans. It's something you have to do. Um, even if you're not required by the, the funding agency to do a DMP, it's something in terms of doing ethical scholarship, something we should consider. During the project, of course, as you're doing this work, you, you have to ensure that your metadata has quality. Um, you have to ensure that you're, you're following all the steps because it is a lot, e even if it is annoying to have to perhaps enter the metadata and be very meticulous about it during the life of the project, it's so much more work at the end of the project. And at the end of the day, if there's no metadata on this project, it, it's, it's not going to be very useful. Um, so this is something that during the project you have to be very vigilant. And then finally, at the end of your project, place your data in a trusted data repository to enable its use and reuse. And, and again, the, the trusted part's really key here because it, we have to pick something that has a very good and robust citation environment, sort of following the recommendations and, and sort of the analysis that I, I just spoke about in the analysis we did in Deliverable 3.5, um, but also making sure that it's something that's going to last for a long time. You, you have to you know, sort of select your infrastructure wisely and know that it's something that will continue to be financed and will continue to be there uh, because it's, it's really well and good to have your, your data somewhere. But if the website goes offline in two years, uh, that represents a serious problem in terms of maintaining the reusability and findability of this data. So those are our sort of brief recommendations on how to build in, in practice a, a good citation before, during, and at the end of your project. Um, I will now hand over to my colleague, Cesare Concordia of the CNR. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Cesare Concordia from AST CNR. I'm a computer scientist. And uh, if I'm able, okay, <clears throat> I will talk to you about uh, the the prototype. It's a software uh, framework. It's a software tool that we developed in this task, um, partly uh, for uh, ex uh, ex for for our research for uh, for doing the the all the uh, investigation uh, that have been presented by Ed and Nicolas, 
and uh, also <clears throat> in order to let's say to explore the the land uh, of the of the <clears throat> of the um, citation uh, framework that's implemented in the in the in the repositories uh, of uh, and also in the uh, agencies uh, that uh, manage uh, persistent identifiers and so on. So the the mainly the 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 goal of the prototype is to harvest information uh, in the <clears throat> harvest metadata from, from the, in this uh, in this landscape, uh, starting from PIDs or uh, uh, also um, any kind of uh, possibly any kind of PIDs uh, uh, associated with a data set or uh, a data. Um, getting information, uh, th this metadata uh, can be in landing pages or, or, may, uh, or maybe in, uh, in uh, um, uh, provided by repositories using uh, uh, APIs, uh, not, uh, so not uh, um, embedded in the, in, the, in the HTML or PDF landing page of the describing the, the data set, but maybe uh, with a, a separate entry, entry point that uh, can be actioned <clears throat> as API, or uh, those information are uh, rec collected uh, and uh, when comes from different sources, the prototype try to harmonize the results uh, in order to present them in a standard way. And also the prototype uh, uh, publish uh, this functionalities uh, through an API. Uh, that, it's a, it's a, a REST API that returns JSON or so st standard as much as possible. Um, the, the key functionalities are um, explore uh, metadata, data set metadata, uh, getting metadata from repository or other sources, uh, provide fac facilities for curation and, uh, let's say, semantic annotation of the citations, and show and uh, enable uh, users to exploit citations metadata and also disseminate metadata. Um, okay, first let me check let me show you a couple of tables <clears throat> uh, we uh, expanded the, num the, the the repository list that uh, <clears throat> um, I, it has been shown by ed with uh, additional repository that includes not only research <laughs> repositories but also external like for instance uh, uh, newspaper uh, data repositories and so on and we use the data of uh, retrieve data um, uh, service in order to um, <clears throat> have some uh, number about the use of uh, the persistent IDs, what kind of persistent ID are used by this the list of repositories we are, we are going to, uh, to, to check, to explore. And uh, this is the, many of them use uh, HDL or DOI, and uh, but in, there are cases where the PID are locally or, or not present, or there are local local <clears throat> uh, defined um, in the in the so not so useful for us. Uh, another thing we uh, we investigated how many of these repositories provides API and distribute metadata using API. Uh, most of them uh, know, but there are an um, encouraging number of repositories that provide API <clears throat> the metadata through API. And last one, uh, if the repository uses a standard, a metadata standard to distribute, <clears throat> uh, to distribute uh, the, the, the metadata. 
and uh, again, uh, uh, yes, uh, the R3 data say that many of them uh, has uh, uh, their own metadata standard, and some of them use some standard. Um, starting from this number, uh, we, we try to um, design <laughs> the, the landscape where the prototype <clears throat> uh, uh, should uh, harvest for metadata. Essentially, we individuate um, three different uh, <clears throat> actors or entities. Uh, the the repository of the that uh, of the of the of the data the PID registration agency that uh, uh, normally collect metadata and has metadata about the uh, the, the data sets and uh, uh, linked by the um, <clears throat> by the by the the mm, about the data set. And also there are a number of knowledge graphs uh, where there is metadata uh, about uh, a specific, when well, maybe uh, uh, metadata about the data set, but uh, mainly related to the, to the, um, to the interact, the, let's say the connection between uh, papers and data and so on. So the prototype, um, uh, the prototype, uh, um, execute uh, a number of uh, different actions depending on the, uh, uh, this, the, the, the entity is going to explore for metadata. For, for uh, the repository, the idea is to parse the, um, the landing page to find the metadata format, uh, or if uh, it provides API and we know it, using R3 data information, try to connect with the API. For the registration agency, uh, for DOI, for instance, there, are, there is a content negotiation that can be used or um, particular uh, registration agency provides APIs. So, And for knowledge graph, mainly there are triple stores or anyway, semantic uh, semantic uh, <clears throat> database that can be queried via Sparkle or others. But at this moment, we are not much exploring this third part of the... The, the metadata is uh, collected and uh, let, let's say stored in, uh, in our uh, repository in order, and in some way we try to, <clears throat> to understand how uh, if, if, if there are different sources, uh, we, we, we try to understand um, how to merge, but it's not easy, as you can imagine, uh, the, the metadata to have um, a way to enrich or to, to <clears throat> better uh, exploit the citation. Um, this is an example, for instance, uh, of a very uh, well done data set starting from the, uh, that is in Zenodo, starting from the, uh, the PID, which is a DOI, we are able uh, to collect, um, uh, to, <clears throat> uh, to parse the Zenodo uh, metadata for, and have this metadata uh, about the, the, the data set uh, described in this landing page. But also the DOI registration agency, if asked with the, um, the content negotiation protocol, returns another subset of metadata for the, for the, for the data set. Um, this two, uh, these two subsets are uh, in most of, most of of the of the properties are uh, refer to the same entity. For for uh, for instance, li it, the license in the repository metadata is the same of copyright, author and creators. Different label to indicate the same entity, but there are uh, some particular uh, <clears throat> entities that is not contained in one or another. So we use this to enrich. Uh, 
um, to, to, to create a, a new profile for this citation in our, in our repository. And uh, even when uh, the, 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 let's say, the entity refers to the same, uh, is refer, referred as the same, for instance, lic license and copyright, for the same data set, we can have a different values. In this case, we have the URL to the license uh, legal code. And in, in another, we have the name of the, of the license. So this is the, 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 the scenario. And the, the, <clears throat> the prototype uh, shows, uh, the prototype try to harvest the data and try to parse the data and store locally uh, this kind of, of information uh, and of course provide uh, an API uh, that can be used by any software agent, this is a JSON uh, request, or for, by the shock uh, citation uh, viewer that I'm going to show you in the next slide, I think <clears throat> I will have a few minutes again. Uh, the, the, the citation service API is a, a simple API which provides the, the, there is a description of every entry point and a number of entry points that can be used or tested. <clears throat> and the, the citation metadata viewer is a web a application. Um, it, um, <clears throat> is pre present uh, uh, as a in, divided in two parts, citation and the properties of the citation. Um, the, mm, the, the, the input can be done by uh, writing the, the, the PID and then uh, uh, clicking on uh, OK, uh, search metadata. The metadata is returned, the citation of the, of the data set, if found, is returned, and also met, all the metadata <clears throat> uh, are uh, shown as, uh, let's say, um, uh, windows. But uh, in some cases, for instance, there is the possibility that, for, for instance, this, this, this metadata has a property which is called distribution, and then the prototype recognize the distributions uh, links to the actual file because when uh, actual file that contains the data set, uh, so uh, make it actionable by adding uh, the download and or the uh, send to LRS. I mean, uh, when the, the DOI doesn't actually uh, link to the actual data set, but to a landing page of the data set where you find the link to the data set. In this case, this is um, uh, recognized by the viewer that uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 enable a user to automatically download starting from the DOI to automatically on, uh, download a data set. Um, uh, the, the, another functionality is that the, the, the whole uh, data set is provided as JSON, so can be down, down, can be <clears throat> uh, used uh, as it is in a different program. I think I have finished just the last one. Is the, the, there are a number of links that you can, where you can test, uh, of course, the prototype. Uh, these links are. Um, um, over development version, so you can experience some problems because we are still working. In the future, we will move on a stage version, uh, the prototype, so it can be tested <coughs> by external user. And the, we have used the, um, our prototype for checking the citation from a, a number of abstract and the, 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 the result and the algorithm is explained, is exposed in a Python notebook that can be, uh, that is available for comment or suggestion. Um, yes, I think I finished, probably Nicolas. Thank you, Nicolas. 
So the, <coughs> this webinar was to convince you that uh, citations are important. And uh, of course, this was the goal of, uh, of the task to deal about data citation. And uh, there was a discussion in the chat about actionability. Actionability for us, it's really a key. Uh, but you, you saw during this webinar that before going to actionability, we need to gather a lot of information. And you also realize that the information is not in one place. Uh, you need to, to get information from an API, from the landing page, from a, PIDs and PIDs, even if it's DOIs, it's, uh, you get a limited uh, amount of information because uh, when you register a DOI, for instance, you have only a few metadata uh, available uh, to register. And also, citation alone, so I put in the slide, is uh, totally uh, useless. Uh, you need a good uh, uh, ecosystem uh, to uh, to provide citation and uh, of course you have you need to have documentation you need to be to have a good practices as we uh, as it was explained by Ed in our recommendation <coughs> also we need to use norms and standards and especially it was also explained by Ed uh, if you are mentioning an author for instance or if you are mentioning uh, type of data, it's uh, useful to use uh, specific vocabularies that are machine actionable. For authors, for instance, you can use ORCID. Uh, for data type, you have a lot of different uh, possible vocabularies, which, has, <coughs> which are uh, machine actionable. And of course, maybe the main part is to have repositories that uh, are trusted. Trusted, what does it mean, trusted repositories? You you saw the result of our survey, so Ed explains that uh, we define a set of criteria, but uh, there were also another criteria, the criterium, criterium, sorry, that we didn't mention, but something that uh, a repository need to last to be able to provide PIDs on the long term, which is really important, and of course we you need to have dissemination tool. The prototype is an attempt to uh, build uh, a tool to disseminate automatically information and to disseminate it in a standardized way to give visibility to uh, research, but also to retrieve easily uh, that data set. And what's next? Uh, we published, uh, we. We published a poster in a conference uh, to explain that data citation, it's, if you have good practices and to build good data citation, it's a really good base uh, for data papers because you have all the information available in a very standardized way. So it's, uh, it's not enough for a data paper, but it's really a good, strong basis. And uh, as I said in the chat, uh, you can use this information to build Upon uh, when it's actionable, you can build. Uh, other, you can think about other services that you can build on citation, and it's not only now. It's not only a citation, but it's a tool that you can use to uh, build new services. And we made an experimentation, for instance, with a uh, clearing the switchboard to associate with a data type a tool to a specific data set, and then you have a sort of a continuum between uh, data set tools and publication, and so on. I'm finished. If uh, Cesare, Dan, or Ed, you want to add something, you are welcome. Yeah. Well, I have a kind of moderator role in this. And uh, there are a few questions uh, that I think we could uh, concentrate on. Uh, but first, there was the you want, you said you answered that already, uh, Nicolas. But there was the question from Case with respect to the involvement of journal uh, editors. Uh, I think he meant to promote uh, good quality data citation. And uh, you, you, you mentioned there that, uh, well, we were concentrating on the data side of things. So, um, does that mean that uh, the uh, journal editors are not important in the whole process or just that we had too little resources to also uh, try to take them on board? Um, and yes, if we, 
and what we wanted to do in this round table is uh, mostly, well, first of all, to validate what we have put in the recommendation. And it was really useful because we had, uh, Ed, you didn't mention that, but we have a round of reviews about, uh, of this recommendation. And we, we changed a lot of things after the round table and uh, after the round of review. And also, uh, publisher, you know, journals publisher, they are not on the same, uh, on the same uh, line because they are used to, they are used to, uh, to build the citation of publication and data citation is something different. So we mostly involve at the beginning people, uh, who are specialized in data citation and more specialized in data. But that doesn't mean that we don't have any contact with, uh, um, publisher, uh, I can cite my my own uh, my own case in France. We are beginning a big project with Open Edition. Open Edition in France is a is a publisher and uh, of book and journals, and uh, and we are going to build a big project to link data and publication. So this is one example of what we can do. But we need to have actionable citation for that. And did somebody mention data journals? You know, journals specifically dedicated to uh, data sets that uh, become available. You want to? Yes, because I know you and I, and I we had this, uh, how do you say, this paper together, mm -hmm. which also uh, was on, let's say, partly on the topic of data journals. They, they exist in other disciplines, less in SSH. Yeah, they exist in other disciplines. Why do they not exist in the SSH? Is there, there is one, attempt, one or two attempts. Mm -hmm. we, we have done a sort of survey of that also. Uh, in the first, uh, in the first uh, inventory, we have done a survey also of existing things related to data citation. And right now, I may say that I, I found only four or five examples in SSH, but it's uh, it's evolving. And uh, one example was in uh, geography, mainly. Okay, let me read Case's answer uh, here. My experience is that journals have some requirements for data citation that are very sketchy, but more importantly, they are not enforced by the editors of these journals. Thus, publications are very fake in their data citation. I think that varies by discipline, but I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to, to how do you say, to uh, make that stick. Yes, and, uh, and you know, uh, Seth, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly, uh, there are a lot of, uh, the, from the beginning of the project to now, there, were, there have been a lot of uh, changes uh, regarding uh, the importance of data in a SSH. And for instance, Elsevier uh, is pushing you to put your data in, a, in, the, in, a, in the Elsevier repository. I don't remember the name right now of the repository, but uh, you know there is a sort of a, of a incentive to put your data, and they want to they want to keep your data on their repository, of course. Yeah. Okay. There is one topic I want to propose myself to, to discuss a bit. It was mentioned that, uh, of course, it's important to provide uh, high quality metadata in your uh, on, on the landing page uh, so that, that the citation uh, can be, uh, how do you say, properly interpreted. Um, now, you, most of you know that there is this, um, let's say, this new urge to create what they call research graph, knowledge graph, research graphs. Uh, and there are quite a few of them around. Now, mm -hmm. most of these uh, graphs are being created automatically, right? And let me also put, by the way, the uh, open SSH uh, uh, marketplace uh, there, because that's also an automatic process by which um, metadata is being harvested from some repositories and connected to, uh, to other interesting information, creating bundles of related uh, information resources. Now, this is, again, an automatic process. There is some um, let's say editorial work going on, but not that much because we all know that editorial work is quite expensive. 
um, it, how, how does that compare with with citation? Is, is citation can citation be a way to guide these uh, automatic processes? Uh, it's a question for me or for Ed? for every for everybody, also for the audience. Uh, if you have an, an yes. idea there, but I think this process uh, of uh, having a good data citation, uh, you know. That means that you have a good quality, you have a good structuration of information. And uh, it's, as I said about data uh, papers, it's a good base for building afterwards a, um, a graph. And Cesare, maybe you can say a word about uh, the uh, open well, well, yeah, I, if, if I could jump in, I, I think it's, it's interesting because when we have these metadata, that are you know encoded into the page and are machine actionable. It really gets into this whole idea of interoperability, which is you know one of the four bits of a fair. And whether it's used towards a citation purpose, whether it's used towards sort of a discovery open graph purpose, mm -hmm. that that all enters into this idea of interoperability, and then makes our lives as researchers more rich. Um, so that would be my response to, to that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, nothing to add. That uh, just to add that in our experience, uh, the minimum set of metadata we found on almost any uh, landing page is the Open Graph metadata, <laughs> because mm -hmm. it is used by Google or uh, let's say others to uh, mm -hmm. harvest information to build scholar graphs and so on. So um, um, I think uh, yes, it's a. Uh, it's a good a good yeah. way to I, I would even like to put it in a more provocative uh, way that uh, providing good uh, quality metadata is one of the few chances that researchers have to let's say make sure that these automatic processes do not misinterpret uh, what is the quality what is the the meaning of the of the data set uh, because whatever we do, whatever they do, uh, it will be harvested, also bad quality metadata, and you never know how it appears in some other database, right? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I like that. You know, I'd, I'd like to have a chance just for the recording to, to read what uh, Philip uh, just, just said, which is, you know, when working with recommendations for link language and linguistic data, we discuss the relation between citation and acknowledgement. Uh, there might be contributors who aren't part of a citation or reference, but they should be acknowledged. And in many repositories, such contributors can be added to the metadata um, yeah. and should be. Maybe so I think that's something... interesting because it gets back to this interesting sort of idea of like, why do we cite? Why as scholars do we cite? Um, there's this idea of you, you want to give credit you want to show where you're getting your sources from. I mean, these are sort of the fundamental things. But now that we're in this brave new digital age with interoperability and reusability, then you get this sense of, you know, this data has to be interoperable. We have to be able to find this data and continue to use it. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that this tension, um, it doesn't need to be a tension, but this sort of developing from just acknowledgement and into interoperability is, is still something that we're all dealing yeah. with. This fits with what Philip, Philip Concept is, uh, uh, wrote in the chat, when working with recommendations for language slash linguistic data, we discussed the relation between citation and acknowledgement. There might be contributors who aren't part of a citation slash reference, but they still should be acknowledged. In many repositories, such contributors should be added to the metadata. Indeed, you have more possibilities in the metadata to fine tune the proper acknowledgement. Yes, the, the Zenodo metadata actually provide this possibility. If you uh, search for metadata inside, the, you find the, the contributors, uh, and for every contributor, affiliation and so on, other than uh, creators. So, okay, this is... Uh... Yes. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, there, there's a question um, from Philip again. Are there any recommendation on who should count as authors for a data set? Um, none that we came up with. Um, so that's an an easy answer for you there. That's a very good point and a very uh, something we should have thought of. Um, but in general, do, are you all aware of 
It depends a bit on the discipline. Uh, Philip is from linguistics and I happen to remember that especially in case of endangered languages, there was some years ago quite a, let's say not a fight, but a disagreement on who would be the author of a recording, for instance. Is it the guy that, uh, take, that makes the recording or is it the guy who is uh, speaking? That's, uh, and I think that that depends a bit on the the context, but also the discipline. Yes, and uh, I know the situation in linguistic. Of course, you need to have some rules about uh, different authors, uh, which generally speaking, if if I'm not wrong, Cesare and Ed, we don't find this kind of a granularity of a fine description. Of authors, and uh, for instance, yeah, I remember in linguistics we have, uh, you have to, to, get, to to mention who is recording, who is doing the recording, who is doing the research with that, and who is speaking. And uh, generally speaking, it's not uh, it's not possible to yeah. Yeah. to discuss that. that. That's also another uh, point. Uh, with our own community-specific metadata sets, we might let's say, uh, ac accurately describe this uh, information. But you know, if we get into the uh, the maelstrom of uh, the harvesters, the general harvesters, all this kind of subtlety gets lost. So this is perhaps a call to uh, not to let go of our, let's say, uh, suitable metadata sets and schema too soon, if we want to keep this information around. Yeah. Yes, I see somebody makes a suggestion looking at the IFLA roles for vocabulary. That's certainly something I will note to do. Yes, but uh, OK, you have uh, different roles, but uh, it's very difficult to include that in uh, generic vocabularies from a landing page like a Dublin Core or this kind of, uh, of a schema.org, which are the most, most common. And, uh, so you, of course, you lose a little bit of information on the landing page. But this is also the reason why that uh, Cesare explained that we use refree data to find an API and get more information, more, uh, more uh, precise information. And then we gather everything in, uh, in our prototype and that uh, this is also the reason why we have this prototype to try to gather information from different sources and enrich them. Remember then that we also, at the beginning of the task, we also think that uh, we are going to let people enrich manually uh, the information, but it's not developed yet. Well, that's, that's the way of all good plans, uh, great plans, I would say. They need resources to effectuate them. And, uh, but the idea will stay around and maybe in the next iteration we can uh, enhance the prototype with such uh, functionality. I still think that things like uh, semantic annotation, if done by uh, the right group of people, can enormously enhance uh, uh, the, the usability of uh, data sets, data set, metadata, uh, but also of citations. But convince the funders. <laughs> okay. So maybe I think we address the all questions. Yeah, uh, I think so. Because uh, there are a lot of, yeah, and you, you, you realize that uh, after two years of, uh, nearly three years of project now, there are a lot of, uh, of things to improve. <laughs> we have room for improvement about uh, at every stage from the beginning with the recommendation. And uh, we discover also that uh, we can give some advices also to repositories. And, uh, and all the, in all the steps of, the, of the, this sort of a chain, we, we can improve things. Yeah, true, true. Maybe one last question from Uto Hofstetter. I remember attending a shock webinar offering a tool to generate citation outputs with several citation styles. Is there a connection to your tool? I remember that uh, webinar also. 
And I think that was a general uh, tool available on the uh, on the web. So no direct uh, uh, connection to uh, uh, the citation prototype. Good, yeah. I think. We, as we have standardized information, we can generate a citation in every format. True, but that was not the, uh, how do you say, the, the, main, the main purpose of the citation prototype. No, but it's inside the product. It's possible, it's possible. Yeah. Okay, then I think we have, I think, fulfilled our duty, all the presenters and the audience. So uh, let me thank everybody. And uh, I hope uh, citation keeps a uh, warm spot in your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone, and a good weekend. Ooh.